Welcome to the Browns vs. Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are so delighted that you have taken the time to continue to be here in fellowship. Most of you, I saw you at Sabbath School, so I am just uh, welcoming you again. Uh, for those of you that are at home, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. Um, we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, I would like us to, that we have several members of our church family that are either sick or they're in the hospital. So I would like us to take some time to uplift them in prayer. Um, we have also members that are recovering from surgery. So I'm going to throw up a few names. Um, they're not, it's not an all exhaustive list. Uh, there's others that you know. So we're going to take some time and we're going to pray for those names prior to our praise team coming over and, uh, leading us to God through music. Is that okay? Yeah? And for those of you that are at home, if there is someone that you know that needs prayer, just go ahead and type their name and any information that you may uh, be able to give us so that we can keep them in prayer. So let me just give you some names. Uh, we want to keep Hilda Hammerly in prayer. She's recovering from surgery. We also want to keep um, Judy in prayer. Uh, our very own Debbie's mom. We want to keep Charlotte in prayer. That's our very own Chris mom. By the way, those of you that do not know who Chris and Debbie are, they're sitting right there in the back, making sure that uh, our programming is available for those that are not able to be here in person. Or something that's happening now is when people travel, they still connect with their home church because we have something um, online that is uh, being streamed out from the church that they regularly attend. Uh, we also want to keep Kelly, our sister Kelly, uh, in prayer. Uh, she's, uh, she's in the hospital, and she's going to stay there through the weekend. And they are running some tests, and they might be doing uh, surgery. Uh, so please pray that the tests yield the information that the medical team needs and that they're able to, to, get, uh, to get that done. Um, and, uh, I know there's more names and they're escaping me right now, but let's, uh, let's keep, uh, thank you. Helen, as you can see, she's recovering from her surgery. Thank you so much. So we want to keep Helen as well in prayer. And just, uh, briefly, I want to let you know, and again, the reason why I'm letting you know this, this little bit of information it's simply because if you're like me, when I see a dog, I want to, and they're friendly, I want to pet them, I want to say hello. Uh, the dog that is here with us in our worship service is a service dog, so we're not allowed to pet the dog. So please hold your urges, smile, wave, make her feel welcome, but uh, please try not to pet uh, the dog. Uh, let's uh, take some time. I'm going to kneel, and uh, I'm going to be praying in silence for some time, and then I'll close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that you give us to come together as a church family 
and draw one another closer to you by uplifting each other, by singing together, by praying together, by worshiping you together. That at this moment we are praying for members of our church family who are in a special need of you. That we want to uplift um, Hilda Hammerly and ask that you be with her as she is recovering from her surgery and be with her husband as he's there providing support and being there for her. That we also want to uplift Helen, I connect and, and ask that you please um, be with her as she's recovering from her surgery and be with her kids, be with her husband as they're maybe picking up some extra things around the house that normally she does so that she's able to uh, rest uh, her hand and not use it so that he can fully recover. That we also want to uplift uh, um, Kelly. Right now, she's in the hospital and they're running some tests and we just pray that you give wisdom to the medical staff that is providing this, this much needed service to her and uh, we pray that, that when the tests are done, they will know exactly not just what is not working right, but how to help her. And when the surgery comes around, that they are able to do it in a way that it fixes the problem and the Kelly can come home feeling much better. That we also want to uplift uh, Judy and ask that you be with her. Uh, help her to have that, that, that certainty, that assurance that what she's going through, she's not going through it alone. Yes, she has her daughter, she has family that love her, but she also has you right there, right next to her. We want to uplift Charlotte in prayer and ask that you be in a very special way with her and be with her children as they encourage and strengthen and just love on her and also continue to be uh, with her at this time that she would have the assurance of your everlasting present presence by her side. That there are other members of our church family that at this moment are going through some sort of medical condition, whether it's something simple like a call or something a little more difficult, and we just want to ask that you be with them, that, and that you will continue to be with us as a church family, that we would know how to be there for them in a meaningful way. But that we thank you, because when we pray and when we ask for healing, and when we ask that you intervene, and when we ask that you come into someone's life, that we're praying from a place of faith. We're praying from a place of knowing that just like you have helped us in the past, you would help us this one time. So we pray trusting and believing that you're able to meet each of the needs that were mentioned, each of the needs that... Um, the people that we're praying for have that we don't even know about. We pray knowing that you're able to meet those needs and we place them in your hands. This we pray in Jesus' name and may your will be done. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask our praise team to come up and get ready to be blessed as we connect to God in prayer. And hey, we have a young face here with us. How are you? Oh, doing good. How's school going? That is, well, welcome back. Welcome back. Glad to have you back. Good morning, church family. Oh, good morning, church family. Thank you. Thank you. Because if I've got to carry the conversation, it's going to be a very boring day for all parties involved. Welcome to Brownsburg, everybody. It's a beautiful day outside. We can, uh, when we're all done here, we can go out and hang out in God's nature and have a good time. 
But while we're in here, we're going to praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I've got a big praise. We had the Pathfinders out camping last weekend, another beautiful weekend. We did not freeze to death Friday night. Praise the Lord. Uh, we tried, though. Um, but we all came back safer, sounder, and, well, some, some of us a little more beat up than others. But I'm happy to be here with you guys this weekend, uh, or this Sabbath, excuse me. We're going we're gonna to sing two praise songs this morning, and due to uh, technical upgrades in progress, this is going to be awesome, guys, uh, we're going to have to use our hymnals today. So if you guys reach into the pew in front of you, pull out the hymnals, you're not going to have to flip very far. We're going to start with hymn number four, uh, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And we're going to finish with hymn number 12, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. So let's start with hymn number four. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. I'm going to ask everybody to please stand, if possible.
We are here in your place, in your house, to worship you. And we pray that as we continue to engage with you through music, through your spoken word, through prayer, that we can sense your presence, that we can feel your spirit moving in our hearts. And we thank you for the blessing that we have, to have a place where we can come to freely worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So for everybody that's not quite caught up, uh, this weekend's kind of special for those of us that are, actually everybody sitting in this room has a mother somewhere, and it's Mother's Day weekend. Tomorrow we celebrate Mother's Day as a nation, but today we're going to celebrate as a church family. Um, and uh, <laughs> I thought I was going to be all, you know, real clever going into Merriam-Webster's dictionary and looking up the definition of a mother. Um, it literally says a female parent. That's it. How sad is that, guys? For everything a mother does for us, you think they could come up with something a little more than a female parent. So we decided to, to ask our pathfinders and adventurers <laughs> how they would describe their mother. I know a dangerous thing, right? So here's a, here's a, here's a list of what they came up with. Helpful, nice, caring, a great teacher. She takes us fun places. And they even added, even if she's tired. Encourages us to follow our dreams. Reads to us. Takes care of our house. Gives good hugs. And keeps us healthy. And there's one I would like to add, and it's she gently, and sometimes not so gently, guides us to the right path. I can still remember the look that my mom used to give me when I was a kid acting inappropriately. Sometimes not such a kid, but still. And there was no anger. There was never any anger. Just that look of dreaded and soul-piercing disappointment. And it made me really look at what I did and how I cannot try to do it again because I did not want to disappoint my mother again. Sometimes it took way too long to figure it out, but luckily, patience is one of those virtues of a mother as well. So it sounded to me like our kids had the right idea. They do notice what moms do. They see it, and they know that that must be a mother. So when you look up in the dictionary, and it says that you're just a female parent, know that your kids see so much more in you, and that your life can affect theirs for many, many years to come. And not just their lives, but their kids' lives as well. And there's a poem that I found that, that really summed it up for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mom, I know we've been through a lot, but to this day, I have not forgot all the things you have done for me, opening my eyes, letting me see all the rights and wrongs in life and help me battle my everyday strife. To know your love is a great feeling. Thinking of it helps me with dealing. And on this special day, I will always say that I love you in each and every way. You are the perfect mother for me. And no matter what I want to be, I know you will always be there to show me that you care. I hope this touches a special place in your heart because no matter what, I shall never part. I love you, Mom, in so many ways. And today is for you, Mom, your special day. So at the close of service today, since we don't really want to be passing stuff out right now, um, there will be a vase set up in the uh, foyer out there as you leave. Um, if you're a mother, please, please take a flower. We got them for you. But not only that, if there are flowers still sitting around and you have a mother figure in your life that you would like to bless today, feel free to take a flower. It's not a problem. And let them know that they have been a blessing to you.
Thank you. I might as well just stick around because we have a scripture reading. Our scripture reading today is taken from uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. God is great. Above all things. Ooh, so good to be here at the Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Are you guys excited today? You, you, you're, really, you're really excited behind the mask, right? It's the mask that's not letting me see the excitement for those of you that are wearing masks. Um, thank you so much uh, to our praise team. Thank you so much for honoring our mothers. Um, this weekend is, is, is just a way here in America uh, in which we try to, to, to at least, right, do something. But we know that mothers are deserving of so much more, so much more. Now, for those of you that are, that are at home, uh, there was a song that popped up around uh, 11.05 or so. And it was a special song for all the mothers out there. So feel free to listen to it and uh, feel free to invite your mom to the group so she can hear the song. And on Sunday at 6 a.m., there's a little video that's going to pop up. You don't have to watch it at 6. You can watch it later. Uh, honoring our mothers. And uh, when, I, when I was looking at the video, looking for something to put to say Happy Mother's Day, uh, and I saw this one, I got to say, uh, I, was a little, I was a little teary, uh, and my wife would tell you that that doesn't happen a lot, so I hope that when you see it, you will be moved uh, um, as well. But to all the mothers that are here, Happy Mother's Day. We are so glad that you are part, not just of our life here in the Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church, but in the lives of each of those who call you mother. And those of you that are watching from home, again, happy Mother's Day. Those of you that are mothers, in the announcements that were sent out via email and also there in Brown Chapel, um, Elder David Prevost, he posted a list of pictures with the mothers in our church and who are their children. And he asked that if you don't see your mother's picture there, um, to please send him an email with the picture that you want and then let him know, you know, mother of who, so that he can update it and have a full list of all our mothers. Um, I hope that you can feel that we truly appreciate what mothers do. It's just, uh, it's just incredible. Um, I don't know how you do it. I never will, but I'm the beneficiary of an amazing mother, so I am thankful that you do it. But uh, um, as you know, my wife and I are expecting our firstborn uh, just uh, eight more weeks, eight more weeks yesterday. Um, and uh, we've been doing some classes because I don't know what I'm doing, right? So we were taking some classes through the hospital that um, is going to do the delivery, and uh, I'm beginning to realize uh, how important to a baby a mother is. I mean, for the first several months for sure, but longer, the mom is the restaurant, the chef, the server, and moonlights as the custodial services person for the baby. Uh, and uh, the dad is more like the shear leader and uh, helps with the cleaning, but uh, the, without the mom, there's very little that the dad can do. And uh, uh, it's just at those first few months, uh, if not longer, without a, a caring mother, the impact of that life is significantly harm. So thank you, mothers for the blessing that you are 
to, to all of us children. Thank you so much. So, last week, you, you, you heard a Mother's Day sermon, right? You were here last week? Okay, good. So today, it's not going to be a Mother's Day sermon, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wove it in. I'm going to wove it in, uh, our mothers in there. But the title of, of the uh, sermon today is My Place in the Kingdom. But let me ask you, let me survey the saints. How many of you want to be in the kingdom? That, that would be the kingdom of God, in case you're wondering. Uh, those of you that are at home, if you want to be in the kingdom, I, I don't know, raise a hand, put something in there that says... Uh, you want to be in the kingdom so we can rejoice uh, with you. Uh, soon, we will be able to, again, have uh, uh, slides uh, with text and quotes. Today, I'm going to be doing some reading uh, for those parts. But I want you to please, please thank Lenny uh, Delhi. He's the one that's doing this project. And in case you didn't know, those electrical outlets were not there before. So those electrical out outlets, um, at least I don't remember them in there. Uh, he's, he's doing that work so that we can have this gigantic TV. You can see the excitement, right? So that when we have images and videos and songs to sing, you can easily and readily just read them and enjoy them. So he's doing this work. So if you can please just thank him. Uh, when you see him, send him a, a, a message. Uh, those of you that are tuning online, just write something thanking Lenny for the incredible work that he's doing for us. But soon we're going to have this up. And maybe, just maybe, we might be able to enjoy, those of you that stay locally here at the church, can meeting for our brand, from our brand new uh, system. So looking forward, very excited. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are. We are so thrilled to be your children and so excited that you have blessed us with mothers. That at every stage of our life as children, we never cease to be blessed by a mother who loves her child. So that we thank you for that and want to ask that you be in a special way with each of our mothers. And that as I dive into the message today, my place in the kingdom, I just want to ask that you be with our hearts and that you help us to know our place in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, and may your will be done. Amen. So, you know, through Sabbath school uh, discussions, we've, be, we've been learning incredible stuff. Uh, thank you to Mike for teaching uh, today. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to follow in their footsteps as we dive into the word today. Now, you heard the scripture passage, right? Not the most exciting scripture passage, but in Luke 22, 24, it says, Now there was also dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And the them in this particular verse is Jesus' closest disciples. There's a story about Samuel Logan Brengel. And the story goes something like this. When he was in his college years, he was a brilliant law student. But he noticed that he had an aptitude for public speaking. Now let me see the hands of those of you all here who enjoy standing in front of people and speaking. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Can somebody take notes? Somebody take notes. Those hands that went up, put them up again. Come on. This is a church. We will ask you. <laughs> okay, good. good. Okay. Um, so not everybody enjoys public speaking. So when you know that you have an aptitude for that, that's, you know, that's not something to take lightly. So he not only saw that he was gifted in the area of public speaking, but he also felt called by God to go into ministry. 
So when he finished his Bachelor of Arts degree, instead of going into law, continuing to pursue that, he decided to become a circuit preacher for the Methodist Episcopalian Church. And during the years that follow after that, he was recognized as an excellent preacher, and he was recommended to become the pastor of a large church. The leaders of the denomination even thought that he may one day become a bishop, which is a prestigious uh, leadership position within the Methodist Episcopalian Church. So, as a result of all this, uh, Brengel decided to enroll at the Boston Theological Seminary and pursue a Bachelor's of Arts in Divinity. Remember, his other undergrad degree was more dealing with what was going to prepare him to become a lawyer. Now, he wanted to do this before moving into more responsibilities. Now, around this time, the Salvation Army uh, church or denomination was established. And Brengel was drawn to their teaching. He was drawn to what they were all about. So rather than continuing in the Methodist church, he resigned from his responsibility and he offered his services to the Salvation Army. Now, because he wasn't part of that denomination, he had to learn the nuts and bolts of what they were about. So he and enrolled in, in a, a curriculum, in a school, so that he can learn to become a minister for the Salvation Army. Now, remember, he was a good communicator. He was praised highly by those in the Methodist Church that were looking at him for, for high positions of authority. But when he joined the uh, Salvation Army denomination, and he began to train, his first assigned duty was not to preach to a large crowd, but rather to clean and polish the boots of his fellow officers in training. Now, you got to understand, once you've tasted the limelight, right, it's easy for you to feel that doing anything short of what you were doing is a waste of your time and talents. So he was struggling with this. Is this really what I am supposed to be doing? Is this the best use of the gift that God has given me? And he thought about even quitting. He said this, is this the best they can do for me in the Salvation Army? Did I make a mistake? But then, in his imagination, he pictured Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And then he wrote this in his journal. He wrote, I could see my Lord who had come from the bosom of the everlasting Father and the glories of heaven and the adoration of his host bending over the feet of uncouth, unlearned fishermen, washing them, humbling himself, taking the form of a servant, and immediately I fell on my knees and prayed, Lord, you wash their feet. I will polish their boots. See, at that moment, Brangle learned an important principle about Christianity. See, we, as Christians, have a call to serve others with humility. That is the essence of what we are about, the service of others. Now, I want to dive into the, the disciples, right? This is, this is uh, Jesus' closest friends. This is the group that he's training to carry on the work after he fulfills his ministry here on earth. And uh, the first person that I want us to look at is Judas. You guys know Judas? Um, there were two Judas in the group. I'm 
talking about Judas Iscariot. It, it is easy for us to ask this question. Did Jesus choose him as one of his disciples? Because those of you that have heard anything about Judas Iscariot, you, you know that he eventually became the one who betrayed Jesus. You know that he had a tendency of stealing from the funds that were given for the ministry of Jesus. Now, neither of those are traits of someone that you want around. Maybe, I, I don't know, Director Connect, do you want a, a, a thief and betrayer as one of your leaders in Pathfinders? No, right? It's like, you want people you can trust, all right? So, let's go to the Bible and let's see did Jesus choose Judas as one of his disciples? Or did he just kind of just wander in and, and uh, uh, make himself a place there among the 12? So if you go to Luke, Luke chapter 6, verses uh, 12 through 16. So Luke 6, 12 through 16. It says this. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out, talking about Jesus, to the mount to pray and continue all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them, he chose 12 whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon called the Silat. Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. So, let me ask you again, and uh, if, you, if you know the answer to this, please say it back. Did Jesus choose Judas to be one of his disciples? He did, right? As I reflect on that, because this is Jesus, right? This, this was not a mistake, <laughs> As I reflect on this, I, I, I realize that often, way more often than we deserve, God gives us opportunities to be in his inner circle so that we can learn to be like Jesus. And, and this was Judas' opportunity to learn to be like Jesus. Now, there's a book uh, that has, you know, beautiful stories and narrative about the ministry of Jesus, and it's called The Desire of the Ages. And I want to read some paragraphs to, to uh, see uh, the author's insight into the motivation behind Judas being part of the 12th, right? Because when you're chosen, you still got to agree, right? So Jesus chose Judas, and Judas did agree to be one of his disciples, but here's some insights as to why. So this is the desire of the ages, and the paragraphs are from pages 18 through 21. And he says this, Notwithstanding the Savior's own teaching, Judas was continually advancing the idea that Christ would reign as king in Jerusalem. So his, his thought process was, hey, I'm going to be part of this man's crew because he's going to become king. At the feeding of the 5,000, he tried to bring this about. On this occasion, Judas assisted in distributing the food to the hungry multitude. He had an opportunity to see the benefit which it was in his power to impart to others. He felt the satisfaction that always comes in service to God. He helped to bring the sick and suffering from among the multitude to Christ. He saw what relief, what joy and gladness come to human hearts through the healing power of the restorer. He might have comprehended the methods of Christ, but he was blinded by his own selfish desires. Judas was first to take advantage of the enthusiasm excited by the miracle of the loaves. It was he 
who set on foot the project to take Christ by force and make him king. His hopes were high. His disappointment was bitter. So the feeding of the 5,000 is this incredible story where Jesus does a miracle of meeting the human need to satisfy our hunger. And from just a few pieces of bread and a couple of fish, he was able to feed more than 5,000 people. I don't know about you, but but if I was there, I, I would hope that that gleams of how God cares for those that want to follow him would warm my heart and, and would help me to understand that God is not about power. God is about service and love. Okay? God does not get a kick about having 1,000 people calling his name. He gets a kick about being able to meet the needs of the 1,000 people. But Judas, instead of getting this, he just was more and more entrenched on this ideology of what can I get out of being part of Jesus' closest friends for myself. Another paragraph, Christ's discourse in the synagogue concerning the bread of life was the turning point in the history of Judas. He heard the words, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. That's found in John 6, 53. He saw that Christ was offering spiritual rather than worldly good. He regarded himself as farsighted and thought he could see that Jesus would have no honor and that he could bestow no high position upon his followers. He determined not to unite himself so closely to Christ, but that he could draw away. He would watch and he did watch. Are you following this? He, he hears from the lips of his own master what he is about. And instead of allowing the words that, by the way, we now find in Scripture to move and transform his heart to that of service to others, instead of doing that, what he did is say, you know what, I'm not going to get too attached. So that way, if I need to walk away, I can walk away. You know people like that? You know, they come to church, but they don't get attached. They don't join anything. They're not part of any ministries, even though there's ministries that, that can be blessed by their giftedness. They, they, they make very little effort in befriending anybody so that if they're not here any given day, they don't miss anybody. And they don't care if anybody misses them. See, this is the attitude that Judas had, an attitude of what can I get for myself? Okay, let's continue. Let's continue. From that time, he expressed doubts that confused the disciples. Oh, oh, oh here is where it gets a little controversial, right? Not only is he looking at this whole Jesus ministry incorrectly, but now he's trying to cause trouble with everyone else that is doing their very best to try to follow the master. From that time, he expressed doubts that confused the disciples. He introduced controversies and misleading sentiments, repeating the arguments urged by the scribes and Pharisees against the claims of Christ. All the little and large troubles and crosses, the difficulties and the apparent hindrances to the advancement of the gospel, Judas interpreted as evidences against his truthfulness. He would introduce text of Christian scripture that had no connection with the truth Christ was presenting. This text separated from their connection, perplexed the disciples, and increased the disagreement that was constantly pressing upon them. Yet all this was done by Judas in such a way as to make it appear that he was conscientious. And while the disciples were searching for evidence to confirm the words of the great teacher, Judas would lead them almost imperceptibly on another track. Thus, 
in a very religious and apparently wise way he was presenting matters in a different light from that in which Jesus had given them and attaching to his words a meaning that he had not conveyed his suggestions were constantly exciting and ambitious desire for temporal preferment uh, preferment and thus turning the disciples from the important things they would have considered the decision as to which of them would be the great greatest was generally excited by Judas I know that was a lot but basically what that is saying is that Judas was the kind of troublemaker that led you to believe that he was a good leader but in reality, he was just causing trouble. And he was doing that partly because of his very own selfish desires. See, if you can lead people to think that you are doing God's work by creating conflict and dissension amongst the rest of the people that are trying to follow God, you eventually become sort of, kind of, like their Savior. Thus taking upon yourself a place that only belongs to Jesus. This is what Judas is doing. Because his heart was not in the right place. Okay, a couple more paragraphs. When Jesus presented to the rich young ruler the condition of discipleship, Judas was displeased. He thought that a mistake had been made if such men as this ruler could be connected with the believers, they would help sustain Christ's cause. If Judas were only received as a counselor, he thought he could suggest many plans for the advantage of the little church. His principles and methods would defer someone from Christ but in these things, he thought himself wiser than Christ. When I, when I read that phrase, I was shocked. I, I was shocked to, 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 to see this perspective that, that Judas thought that his ideas for how their church, right, their group should function were wiser than Jesus. That's how much he thought of himself. That's what drove his instigating conflict and dissension amongst the disciples. That's what drove his instigating the disciples to ask who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God when Jesus was about service. What Jesus was teaching them is that if you want to follow me, then you have to be of service to others. That is why Jesus told the young rich ruler that he had to sell everything that he possessed, give it to the poor that serviced, then come and follow Jesus. Now Judas, instead of worrying about the salvation of the rich ruler when he walked away, what he was disappointed with was that these men with money that could have bring money to the ministry that Jesus was conducting, which did require money, right? They had to eat, they had to travel. He was concerned that, that Jesus let go of someone with money instead of being concerned that someone just walked away from salvation himself. Because Judas did not understand that Christianity is and always will be about service. This is the last segment. Judas reasoned that if Jesus was to be crucified, the event must come to pass. His own act in betraying the Savior would not change the result. Jesus was not to die. It would only force him to deliver him. At all events, Judas would gain something by his treachery. He counted that he had made a sharp bargain in betraying his Lord. Judas did not 
however, believed that Christ would permit himself to be arrested. In betraying him, it was his purpose to teach him a lesson. He intended to play the part that would make the Savior careful, thenceforth to treat him with due respect. But Judas knew not that he was giving Christ up to death. How oft, often as the Savior taught in parables, the scribes and Pharisees have been carried away with his striking illustrations. How often they have pronounced judgment against themselves. How often when the truth was brought home to their hearts, they had been filled with rage and had taken up stones to cast at him. But again and again he had made his escape. Since he had escaped so many snares, thought Judas, he certainly would not allow himself to be taken. Judas decided to put the matter to the test. If Jesus really was the Messiah, the people for whom he had done so much would rally about him and would proclaim him king. This would forever settle many minds that were now in uncertainty. Judas would have the credit of having placed the king on David's throne, and this act would secure him the first position next to Christ in the new kingdom. That's the last statement. Judas thought that he can teach Jesus a lesson. Judas thought that by betraying Jesus, he would cause Jesus to be careful in his dealing with him and understand his value to the ministry. Judas thought that Jesus was not going to allow himself to be arrested, but rather when they came to arrest him, he would escape and rise up to power and set a, an earthly kingdom of which he would be, Judas, second in charge. Now, I don't know about you, but Judas spent years learning at the feet of Jesus and he didn't have a clue what Jesus was about. Because if he had paid attention, he would have realized that Jesus did not come to set up a world, an, an earthly, a worldly kingdom. He came here to set people free from their sins so that they can have access to a heavenly kingdom. He came here to give his life as a sacrifice so that our sins can be forgiven. He came here to serve, not to be served. And all alone, even though this was one of Jesus' closest companions, he missed the point. Not only that, Jesus repeatedly let his disciples know that he was going to die. That that was part of his ministry, his mission. But yet, Judas thought that by forcing Jesus' hand, he would come to power quicker. And then, as a thank you, make him the second in charge in the new kingdom. As I reflect on this, I realize that we can be in church our whole life and still miss the point. We can read the words in Scripture and still miss the point if we don't allow the words to change our hearts, if we don't allow ourselves to truly learn at the feet of the Master. Now, as we heard this dissension, this, this instigating, this conflict provocation created some challenges within the disciples, right? So let's, let's go back to, to Luke. Let's go to Luke 22, verse 24 through 27. And let's see what kind of struggles the disciples were having. So that's Luke 22, verses 24 through 27. And he says this, Now, there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. 
And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest am among you, let him be the young, as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is the greatest, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the it is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as one who serves. So the disciples were seeking after positions of authority, and Jesus reminded them, Hey, if you want to be the greatest in my kingdom, what you need to have is a heart bent towards the service of others. But don't take my word for it. This is what I am doing. I am here serving you. If you go with me to Mark, if you go with me to Mark, let's, uh, let's read some more passages here. Mark chapter 10. Verses uh, 35 through 45. Mark 10, 35 through 45. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We're able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism I am baptized with you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is, for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to, give, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So here we have another passage and uh, here we see uh, a, a couple of the 12 struggling with the same thing that Judas would instigate among Jesus' closest friends. Who's going to be the greatest? James and John, they come to Jesus and they, they're asking for the highest positions of authority. But Jesus reminds them that in his kingdom... Those who have the highest position of authority are those who serve everyone else. Is it beginning to sinking? This is part of God's kingdom. That's what this is. The church is not a social club. The church is not a place where you, where you come just to hang out and chit-chat and listen to some good stories and, and that when there's potluck, enjoy some good food. The church is a place where you come to learn that we are about service to others. So I, I don't want you to answer me, but I want you to reflect on this. Are you serving anyone? If the answer is no, then you have missed the point. If the answer is no, you have missed the point. Because we exist to be of service to those around us. 
and, and yes, some of that service takes place here, right? We have a team that is serving right now. Thank you, Mike, Chris, Debbie. We have a team that served as they, as they sang, right? And lo- led us in music. That's part of service. That's the kind of service that takes place here in the building. But this, if the service of the church begins and ends with what happens inside the building, then why are we here? Why are we here? There, there are other places that do a, a much better job than us at that, right? At providing a quality experience inside their buildings. See, according to the words of Jesus to his disciples when they were searching and seeking for positions of authority that they didn't even understand. He said, my kingdom is about service. So if we truly want to follow Jesus, our leadership approach should be that of servants to each other and those around us rather than rulers over each other now that's tough that's tough because i know that it's so tempting to see someone doing something different from the way we do it it's so tempting to go there and try to straighten them up as a ruler but that's not what jesus did Did he call sin by his right name? Absolutely. Did he help people accountable? Yes. But he did it through service. There's a a story about a young second lieutenant um, in Fort Bragg. And um, yeah, they still have those machines. You know those machines where you, you have some food and you put coins and the food comes out? Bending machines, now you can slide a car, right? But in this story, he's one of those bending machines. He, he needs to get some food, and he notices that he doesn't have any, any change. So he looks around, and he sees a private, right? He's a lieutenant. He sees a private, so he's a lower rank. And uh, he says uh, to the private if, if he has some change. A- and the private says, um, yes, I, I think I have some change. Let me look. And as he's looking for the change, this young second lieutenant, he leans over and softly says, that is no way to address an officer. And, and the private, you know, he was taken back a little bit. And then the officer continues, right, the lieutenant. He's like, let's start over again. And he says, uh, private, do you have some change? And the private, he got in attention. He was like, oh, he said, no, sir. (laughs) See, sometimes in our effort to lord over other people, we missed the blessing that they can be to us. But if we would rather serve rather than rule, Maybe, maybe they can reach their full potential. Okay, go with me to John. John chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, last of the four Gospels. Verses 1 through 8. Okay, so let's see if we have an example, right? about what a true servant leader looks like. So John 12, verses 1 through 8. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where, Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, or spikenard, anointing the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. <clears throat> and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. 
and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So again, in this story, we see, we see the character of Judas being reflected. Right? He wasn't concerned about the poor. He was concerned about his pocket. But we also see Jesus commending a woman for doing an act of service on his behalf. Now, please, I don't want you to misunderstand that statement at, at the end that says, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always, as an indication not to serve the poor. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, first, first, you need to come and you need to draw from me. That's what Jesus is saying. So you and I as Christians, we need to first come and draw from God so that then we are ready to be able to serve the way that he wants us to serve and not just the way that we want to serve. A leader amongst God's people is defined by his or her service to others, not by the authority they hold over others. There's a... There is a, a phrase that Frank F. Warren said, if you wish to be a leader, you will be frustrated. For very few people wish to be led. If you en aim to be a servant, you will never be frustrated. Does that happen to you? You're trying to lead people, but they don't want to be led. But everybody wants to be served. So why don't we flip it and start from that point? The example of ministry that Jesus left us was that of service and not ruling over others, but serving them. He healed the blind. He restored the life of people who were needed in their families and had passed away. He taught the multitude. He fed the multitude. Over and over and over, we see Jesus serving others. I want to end with this story. It's a story about a popular young man. This young man was popular among others his age, in his class. He showed aptitudes of a great leader. People loved to follow him. One of his fr friends one time visited him in his house and he went to his room and in his room there was this phrase, one of the pictures in his room. And he said this, I am third. I am third. His friend was confused by what he was reading. So he asked him, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by I am third? And the response was this. It is the motto that I try to use in my life. It means this. God is first. Others are second. I am third. The driving force of our ministry, the driving force of our life should be pleasing God by serving God. Others. Max D. Pree said, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between the two, the leader must become a servant. So I want to ask you this final question. Are you willing to serve like Jesus served? Now, before, before you, you answer that question, there is no greater model to serve in leadership than that of a loving mother. No greater model. Here you have someone who, who does everything, who goes above and beyond to make sure that her children are cared for, not just physically, but emotionally. How many times those of you that, that have 
or had loving mothers, found yourselves in a meaningful conversation with your mother. Maybe you were just frustrated and you needed to vent and she was there by your bed or she was on the other side of the phone just listening and encouraging and taking your side. Often, I spend hours on the phone with my mom. And sometimes the conversations are not that pleasant for my mom because I'm just going through some difficulty and I, I just need to let it out and she's always there. And she never complains. And in one way or another, she lets me know, I hear you, I see you, I understand you, I am here for you. That is servant leadership. See, my mother, for quite some time now, doesn't have to listen to my venting and my frustrations. She already did her part, right? She makes sure that I was healthy when I was born and I was completely dependent on her. She makes sure that I develop good principles. She makes sure that I learn to have a relationship with God. She did all those things when I was younger. I'm a grown man now, Mary have my own family, but my mom never says no to listening to my, my <laughs> difficult moments because she never stopped being a servant leader, even though she's my mom, which hierarchically would make her more than me. See, in our mothers, we have an incredible example. So if you, if you want to, 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 to visualize what does it mean to serve like Jesus served, I want you to picture a loving mother. It could be yours. It could be someone that you know. Picture how they lovingly deal with every single thing that their children throw at her. Picture how after a long day, they come home only to spend time helping their children to do their homework. Picture how after all that, she still takes time to do some activity to put in smile on her son or her daughter. That is servant leadership. And that is what God called each of us to be like in his church. That is why the Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church exists. What will you do with that information? Choice is yours. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you willing to serve like Jesus served? Now that you have that beautiful picture, uh, but challenging picture, right? Because not everybody can do that. Uh, but we have all been called to do it, and God can enable us to do it. If we first lean on him, right, we first draw from him so that we can serve like Jesus served. So if you want to serve like Jesus served, I encourage you to stand up and we're going to pray together and we're going to ask him to give us what we are lacking. Now, for those of you that are at home, if you want to serve like Jesus served, I want you to find the comment section in your device, phone, tablet, computer. And on that comment section, I want you to type this. I want to serve like Jesus served. I want to serve like Jesus served. Later, I read those and I'll pray for those, but I would also include you in the prayer. And in that way, even though we're not all here in the flesh, we're still worshiping together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are, we're standing and we know that the, the challenge, the call is greater than ourselves. But that we also know that you called us to be part of this church family in this particular location of the world for a reason. So that please show us, please strengthen us, please 
enabled us to serve the way that Jesus served. Please help us not to be Judases. Help us not to be those who cause dissension, who cause conflict only because of selfish reasons, but rather to be those who are willing to invest our lives in the service of those that you place before us so that they too can know and feel and experience the love that we feel by having Jesus in our lives. Please, Dad. Dad, those that are standing here, we want to be servant leaders the way that Jesus served and led. Those at home that typed, I want to serve like Jesus served. They also want to be able to be servant leaders. That, But we recognize, we acknowledge that the task is greater than us. So here we are asking you to fill us so that we can be a blessing to those that you want to bless in our community in this moment. That we pray this in Jesus' name, and may your will be done. Amen. You guys want to grab your hymnals and uh, turn to page 377. And we were just talking about going out, being servant leaders, and... Uh, no, no better fitting him than go forth, go forth with Christ. So uh, hymn number 377, we'll be singing all the verses. Bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. If you may be seated, I'll dismissing, uh, be dismissing people.